The wind from the west, from the sundered land. Rot rides it, and the stench of blood. Cursed walker, will you travel there, to the valley of the unfortunate undead? Our young ones are taken by the child thief, Tergol, known for his vile crimes and alchemy of flesh. Distances shift, paths between places warp, as if this pale, lightless world possessed a will and bitter life, its mercy curdled to wrath over a too long age. Who are you, the grave robber with silver glittering between cracked fingernails? The mystic who would bend the world's miserable heart away from its inevitable end. Most likely it makes little difference. No one has seen the sun in years. The old care more for sacrifice and god offerings than their bawling spawn. Doomsayers are proved right time and again and embraced by hidden powers. Maybe it's best to surrender, to trust your own instinct and skill rather than the whim of the dice, before all is drowned in welcome silence. Life locked and failing in a dark ford. What was written must be known. Anuk Schlager, monk of the Gretel Order, encountered the Basilisk Verhu in the year 565 and set down that creature's whispered prophecies. These lost texts came to be known as the Nameless Scriptures. Three hundred years later, while working on a new cathedral, the two-headed basilisks an orthodox branch of the Creighton Order, uncovered Schlegel's tomb, and with it, the scriptures. Since then, all events described within have come to pass. The prophecies are absolutely factually true, and have, thus, supplanted all other scripture. Around this cathedral has grown Galgenbeck, the greatest city that ever was. The basilisks are two and two-headed. The four heads have argued for hundreds of years. Verhu predicts inexorable annihilation, and since he is always right, has become utterly full of himself. He is also the head worship most. If you could learn the codes of the apocalypse, perhaps the right offerings might avert it. Verhu loves his position and hungers for temples to be raised in his name. When the world was but water, dust, and clouds thick with plague-fat flies, came she, first of the basilisks. From the cracks of Bergen Creek she crawled. She bears the head of denial, Lucy who looks up and down. Yet all shall be well. Her twin, Arg, head of deception, claims to be the first prophet of truths now prostituted by Verhu. Few have ever seen her, the oldest, but many walk her twin paths. She spawned many since the dawn of time, their conception not without agony. All were cast down the cliffs of Bergen Crypt. Only he survived. Down in the valley of the unfortunate undead, his eyes locked upon the mountain's peak. He spits out curses upon his evil mother. The head Gorg is bitter, rank with envy that only his twin Veru knows the damned truth. Time and time again his prophecies are brought to be. The piles of gold gift riches from his faithful, teeter and slide, so tall are they. The world dies, even now. Reality decays. Truth becomes dream, and dream... Truth. 
cracks grow in the once stable structures of the past, allowing things misshapen and vile to worm through, emerging in today's wan light. The known world closes in, bounded to the west by the massive Bergen crypt with its catacombs and ice-caked peaks and surrounded by the endless sea to the north, south, and east. Many have plowed the wave's furrow in search of new lands. They all return against their will. Alive or dead. Galgenbeck in the land of Dvaland is the greatest city that ever was. No king or queen rules in Galgenbeck, but an arch priestess. Yosif Amigo, deep beneath the cathedral of the two-headed basilisks, in a cool black chamber, crossed by shards of light, lies her throne. Yosifa, old, but still young. Commoners gossip that she colludes with the god, Necrobel, who gave her eternal life. Necrobel, the shadow that covers all. Necrobel is melancholy, crop failure, conflict, and war. It is said he whispered the apocalyptic prophecies in Verhu's ear. As time grows ever shorter, the two-headed basilisks become ever more desperate in their recruitment. To take one's own life is considered sinful cowardice. The road to salvation lies through mortification of the flesh. The apocalypse is to be met with eyes wide open. Only then can the soul be allowed passage to the shimmering fields. Heretics and apostates are hunted down and corrected in public and at length by the Inquisition. In Tvaland also lies Sarkash. The forest seems lately to spread unnaturally fast. Paths tangle and wind in the overgrown gloom, leading wanderers astray. Far in the depths of Sarkash, always where one least expects to find it, in a halo of dying trees, is Graventosk. A truly ancient cemetery filled with mausoleums, blank-eyed cherubs, stagnant fountains, plague pits, and ordinary graves. But hasn't it grown warmer in this usually cold place? Do you hear the frantic scratching? The air feels heavy, stale, and hard to breathe. Rising over Graventosk like rage rising over pain is the palace of the Shadow King. A gothic black castle, like a mirror to the cathedral of the two-headed basilisks in Galgenbeck. Most of the palace lies in crumbling ruins, home to unfortunate souls sheltering beneath its broken halls. None dare dream what might lie under its rubble-covered catacombs and cellars. Tunnels sprawl beneath like writhing roots, digging deeper into the cold earth like cancerous veins. The inner wing still stands, acting as the home of the Shadow King, a being obscured by ritual. The slaves of the servants of the courtiers of the King come forth and do his will. The title is hereditary. Sons are always born to the Shadow King. Its whispered princes of that line disguise themselves as ordinary men, wandering the ruins engaging in games and tricking travelers, multiplying the miseries of their people. From ages past, Grift grew upon an eastern peninsula of the Endless Sea, cut from the world by the bottomless moor. The thriving city-state can be reached only by three bridges of such might and cyclopean size. It is said that only enslaved giants could have raised them. Grift was once a place of harmony and the light of reason, a shelter from the plague-wracked, war-torn world beyond. But the world turns, and even the moor cannot protect Grift from its inevitable fall. King Sigfum the Kind is mocked in the street. 
Much of Grift has fallen into disrepair as vile creatures begin crawling from the dried, cracked earth. Each night the bridges scream and roar like great ships grinding upon rocks. Sigfum is defeated. He knows the end is near, believes the prophecies of Verhu, and so kindly and calmly prepares his people for death. Huge parchments dot the streets, calendars of despair marking each correct preparation and its time. Each day a leaf is turned, and when the last page comes, Sigfum will march his people to the cliff, Terion, to fulfill what was written. Terion, a thousand meters of vertical rock with the raging sea biting at its base. The Inquisition of the Two-Headed Basilisks is not too keen on the heretical suicide scheme of Sigfum the Kind. Desolation rolls over Kergus like a frost-barren wind. The lawless and forlorn trek across its ice-racked expanse, crawling over the plains or cowering in the cracked earth to flee Blood Countess and Thalia. North, where the wind is born, lies Allianz, a storm-piercing spire city of black glass. Within stands a castle like a waterfall of white stone, the throne of Anthelia. She, as pale as her castle's walls, as youthful as a drop of melting ice. Some say she is eternally young. The gulls cry the names of knights who sought her hand, a reminder that suitors and signs of Anthelia's age disappear in conjunction. But who listens to a gull? And in Kergus, even gulls freeze in the cold that rolls from the dreams of the Countess. Dreams of her unending youth. Anthelia is well aware time is short. Neuroses burden her. Why is everything so pale, so cold? She cries out for color or warmth. She drains the world of both with every glance, touch, and breath. Those who bring her vibrant life are promised great rewards. All fear to do so. Excuses are made, explanations found. The feelings of the Countess are fragile. Her powers absolute. Court life entails gray opulence. Excitement and fear. The Western Kingdom, called Westland in the songs of the simple and rhymes of the poor, once home to peace and wealth when Lake Onda gifted fish of the river trade thrived. Now, terror and despotism stalk. In the secret citadel of the sad but gaudy city of Schleswig, King Fatmu IX schemes. Paranoid, bat, and increasingly mad, he is consumed with psychosis and invisible fears. Obsessed with the prophecies of Verhu, the king raids and invades houses and villages, barns and temples. Nowhere and no one is safe, especially the poor. Taxed into starvation, the contents of their larders and storehouses are carted off by Fatmu's men. A place few wish to speak of is the Valley of the Unfortunate Undead. Rumors whisper the basilisk, he is coiled within its grips, a sight infrequently survived. Lies and legends enshroud the valley, obscuring any truth. Peddler's tales say the soil, the very air, is lethal, bringing a sleepless, stumbling death. This is no clean fate, but a slow-growing, fathomless despair, weighing down the traveler with poisoned memories and dark thoughts until the spark of life is mutated into a mournful, hopeless undeath. Others claim lost wanderers can fall and find themselves in the realm of the dead, when the black soil hungrily drags them under the earth. Those without hope travel here, seeking an end to pain, a golden afterlife beyond this dark and ruined world. 
They gather in suicide cults, and the valley's few twisted trees begin to droop strange fruit from hempen rope. Others plumb the crypt seeking Verhu, believing they can persuade him of other fates. Some simply and stupidly leave gifts and sacrifices to a power they cannot comprehend. Gloom grows, obscuring the world like an oil-stained image. <laughs> <laughs>